Supercharge your workflow with Vue.js so you can build complex applications faster with fewer bugs and more maintainable code. Join Sarah Drasner, award-winning speaker and senior developer advocate at Microsoft, as she covers the foundations of Vue.js, JavaScript's premier framework. She will show you how to harness the considerable power of Vue.js so that you can quickly build standard front-end developer patterns and learn flexible ways to access the underlying API to create custom solutions. By coding along with Sarah in this workshop, you'll learn how to use Vue's directives to speed up your workflow and create easy-to-maintain yet reactive UI, how to use props, slots, and scoped styles to create flexible, reusable components, and how to create seamless and performant animations using the transition component, hooks for JavaScript libraries, and in-out modes. Sarah will also show you how to work with advanced features like filters, mix-ins, and custom directives for a variety of data transformations. How to get a single page application up and running fast with Vue CLI. And how to work with Vuex to manage the state of larger scale applications and asynchronous data. Here's a glimpse of Sarah in action. Hi, I'm Sarah Drasner. I'm a consultant, uh, which does not mean I'm in unemployed. I work for companies like Microsoft and IBM and Salesforce. I was put into a project where they wanted to use Vue. And at first I was like, oh my god, another framework. And as I was working with Vue, I just found it to be really, really elegant, really powerful, really easy to read, simple and legible. Um, and I kind of fell in love with this framework. It was just really, really awesome. Uh, it made me really excited to work with and I felt very, very productive. Um, so this course is going over some of the things that I absolutely love about Vue. We're going to go uh, into directives, methods computed in watch, we're going to talk about components. We're going to talk about Vue CLI and like how to build, you know, real single page applications. We're also going to talk about server side rendering with Nuxt and how to um, route your application. We're going to talk about filters, custom directives, and even mixins. Um, this is a perfect time to learn Vue. This upward trajectory of the like intensity of excitement about this framework is really building. So I really hope you enjoy this course. Light comparison, vanilla JavaScript versus Vue. We're going to do just a really, really simple thing to do just to kind of look at how your workflow might change for something really small. Um, so in vanilla JavaScript, if I want to output like a bunch of, you know, a bunch of things in a list, like let's say I have a manifest file someone gave me and I need to just output it onto the page. Um, I have const items, uh, which is, you know, if you're not familiar with ES6 is like bar. Um, and you have an array of values here, a bunch of stuff. Then in order to output it onto the page, I might write a function that says list of stuff. I create a for loop and I'm going through each one and I'm you know, plotting each one to these LIs. And then I go into the DOM, grab with document query selector, I grab a container and then I'm going to insert the in, you know, all of those LIs into the container. Then I will call that function and then in the HTML, I will say div ID container. So that yields this you know, list of stuff. This is not, you know, nothing special over here. So we've got this new view instance, and we're establishing a relationship with that um, element, that, uh, with that ID of app. And then in data, I have a list that I'm calling items, and I have that array. Then in the HTML, I say div ID app, I have a UL here, and then I say li v4 item in items and output what the item is. And you can already see that that, first of all, that's all I need in order to create this list. That yields all of this. Um, but you can already see how much more declarative this is. I'm not having to write everything like steps in a recipe. I'm literally saying, here is my list, and here's what I want you to do with it. And the computer does the hard work for us. That's really great. Um, so this is a really simple example. You can see how in a larger application with much more complex data that this kind of abstraction really pays off. OK, so the things that I love about it, again, are that it's clean, it's semantic. I really you know, enjoy making uh, apps that are semantic and that are good for blind people and things like that. With Vue, I'm actually working with HTML um, elements a lot of the time, so I can write clear, you know, clean semantic markup. 
Um, it's really declarative, as you saw. It's super legible, um, and it's easy to maintain. It's reactive, which we'll get into in another section. And I'm offered all of these directives. We went over uh, template strings. We went over using st script X templates. But so far, we haven't really like delved into a real build process for Vue. Um, so we're kind of working our way from like the simplest and easiest to kind of you know understand and use right out of the gate to a little bit more complicated of a build process, but much more useful. Um, we're going to start off with Vue CLI, but then we're eventually going to use Nuxt too. And I think Nuxt is really, really cool. I'll explain all the reasons why Nuxt is really cool coming up. So OK, why are we using a CLI or a Vue CLI in general? Uh, because we can use build processes that allow us to use great features like ES6 or SAS uh, or any other libraries and bring them in very, very easily. Um, in CodePen, we've got those little preprocessor tabs. That's really cool, but like we can't do that in the normal build process, just like select from a dropdown. Um, so we need to have those kind of build processes in there if we want to use stuff like ES6. And ES6 is pretty awesome, so we definitely probably do. Um, we're going to build and concatenate single file templates, which are super awesome. And I'm not biased at all. Here are all the trophies in the world. <laughs> um, I think uh, single file templates are, are just like a really, really great workflow. So we'll look at those in this section. Um, it's so that we can not load all of our files at startup. Sometimes we want a lazy load component. Sometimes we need to do asynchronous operations. And uh, with Vue CLI, that really allows us to, that helps us do all of that, not just have everything on the page at once. Um, so that's really great. We can do things like server-side rendering, code splitting. We can get performance metrics about our application. Um, all of these things are really important and really awesome. Um, we can also have build and prod versions. Previously, we've just been using a script that was like the non-minified version and then the minified version. But in real life, what we'd need to do is we'd you know, minify, concatenate, uh, do all of these things to our scripts, and then we'd also be using a different version of that script when we're pushing to production. So this allows us to do that pretty easily. So the first thing that we'd want to do is npm install dash g. This is, uh, installs it globally, view CLI, or yarn add global uh, view CLI, whichever your preference. Um, so I think everybody should actually run this command so that they have it on their machine before we get going. Um, I've already run this, so I'm not going to run it again. Um, yeah, I'll give you a second. Then for the purposes of this class today, we're going to do view init webpack simple my project or whatever you want your project to be named. Um, you can also just use webpack. Actually, I would recommend actually using webpack. But since we're not going to do the thing that webpack itself has that webpack simple does not are things like uh, testing and uh, ESLint configs and things like that that we're not using during this class. So I'm going to do webpack simple today. But in the future, you probably want to be using webpack. If you're more comfortable with Browserify, there's a Browserify template too. So you could also do view init. Um, you know, Browserify or something like that. So there's a few different templates. Is it okay if I use the Webpack instead of Webpack simple? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, there's just a few more options that it'll take you through. That yeah, uh, but already yeah. that we're already passed that. But as yeah. far as the rest of the course is concerned, it sure, sure. Yeah, that it's totally up, yeah, it's totally up to you. I'm using Webpack simple for the purposes of teaching, but Webpack is great and it has things like you know testing um, involved. So then we'd cd into that directory. We'd run yarn or npm install, depending. Use one or the other. Don't go back and forth like I just did in this uh, thing. So use yarn add or use um, yarn. I, I typically use yarn. Um, and then I'm going to say npm run dev. And that will immediately give us a dev server. And the dev server is also a really nice thing about Vue CLI because I can work with it and have it, you know, be a production instead of just like hosting it with some sort of like fought, put, throwing my files in the browser. That's not actually a real build process. So it, it reflects what the user would see a little bit better. Um, and I mentioned these single file templates. What am I talking about? Um, so usually we've been either using a template in that string or we've been wrapping it in that strange script tag. That's not actually how we would use it in real view applications. What we'd have is this template here where we have all of our HTML and all of our markup. We have to return a single um, 
a single a single element. It doesn't matter that it's a div. It could be a span. It could be an SVG. It doesn't it doesn't matter. But you have to return just one. That's the same in React. Uh, for now, I think it's changing. Um, and then we have a script tag where we're going to export default, um, and all of our component logic will go in there. We're, we'll also need to import uh, components into here, which I'll show you how to do in a little bit. Um, but we'd basically have that script tag, and then we'd have this style tag. So this template that with the base of dot view, it's going to be a new file type, a new file extension called dot view, and it will have all this stuff in it. And what I really like about it is that there's no context switching. We have everything in one place that we're working on it in just one location. Um, so we can go in between our HTML and our script like we were doing in CodePen really fast, and we can just do that all in one file, and it stays really, really encapsulated. New files mean no context switching. Yay. OK. So we would import new from components new. So if I have like a parent component and I need to bring another component into this component, and again, if you're familiar with other frameworks, it's very much the same. Um, we're importing that thing in, and then I'm saying in the export defaults, the components that we're using here is new, and that new will allow me to use in this template, this new tag. I'm going to do some live coding where you can see this stuff for yourself, but this is just some base premises. Um, we could also write it this way, where we have like app new is new. So I could, this is ES6, just like usually I'd have to write new is new, but since it's ES6, it's going to say that's a little redundant. Why don't we just say new? And it will, you know, assume that for us. If I wanted to change this though, like let's say my component is named new, but in my markup I need to name it something else, I could do that. I could write app new is new, and remember we said, Camel casing will turn into kebab case when we turn it into those HTML elements. We're going to talk now about filters, mixins, and custom directives. These are like, you know, things that are slightly more, you know, wide, you know, wider spread of view. You could actually be a, you know, view application developer for a while without encountering these or needing them necessarily, but it's also one of those you don't reach for what you don't know kind of situations because they are really useful, um, So, uh, but each one of them doesn't take up an entire course. So we're going to go through three things. They're not related to each other. They're just three different things that are nice and kind of smaller that you should be aware of when working with Vue. I think they're really great. So we'll, we'll talk about filters first. Um, Filters, despite their name, are not good for filtering content like we did with a computed value. You know, like you have like an input where you're writing something, don't use a filter for that. Use a computed value for that. Um, filters, the first thing to understand about them is that they don't alter the data and they're not a replacement for methods. Uh, filters don't transform the data, they just transform the output that the user sees. So it's just for making small tweaks to the way that something looks in some sort of layout form. So I'll give you an example. Um, well, actually, first let's talk about how we're going to register a new filter. So if we're going to globally create a filter so that we can use it anywhere, we would say view.filter, and this would be you know, in our um, main.js file right before the view instance. We'd say view.filter, filter name, function value, and return. We're, I'll go over what, what we're going to use this like with demos in just a second. Uh, we can also register them locally on the component itself, uh, just the way that you do like methods or computed values, and say filters, pass in the filter name, uh, use the filter name, and then pass in a value and, and return. You have to return it. So the way that we use it is like this. Um, usually in these mustache templates, we're just writing data. Uh, we're writing whatever that is. Uh, we'd create a pipe, and then we'd say the filter. So an example of that would be something like text and capitalize. So capitalize is an example of when you'd use a filter. You'd, you're not transforming the data. You're leaving the data how it is, but you're just making sure that everything is formatted correctly, and everything that shows up is going to be capitalized. 
Um, I made like a really simple tip calculator. So we have a customer total one, and that's some value you came from somewhere. Um, and we have filters here. We have tip 15, so 15%. We're passing in the value and returning, you know, the value times uh, 0.15 to fix two. And then in our HTML, 15 is going to be customer total one pipe um, tip 15. So it would look like that. So if we look at the demo here, we've got a tip calculator. This is outputting that first one. And then we've got a few different filters. We've got tip 15, tip 20, tip 25. It's repetitive. We'd usually probably use a method and then bring that into the filter or something like that. Um, but for the purposes of demo, we just have a bunch of filters here that we're using again and again. And we've got customer total one. So we're not actually changing anything about that customer total. We're just making changing it a little bit so that we can output it so that the user can see a different view of that. So it's a little, you know, that's kind of similar to computed values, but computed values do something totally different. This is just presentational. Could you use this like for formatting dates and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a perfect example, formatting dates. Um, uh, you know, we're going to do an exercise later where you make, you know, first, second, third, fourth, you know, you create the, you know, based on the number. Um, so we can also chain filters. So if we have something like this, um, this data, we're going to say, it's going to say the data, and then it's going to be filter A and filter B, and the first one will be applied first, and the second one will be applied uh, after, and so that kind of is important when you get into something like this, where we've got the original number, plus 5 is 7, times 2 is 4, and then plus 5 then times 2 is 14, but times 2 plus 5 is 9, so that, you know, the order of operations there kind of matters. You can pass arguments as well if you need to. So um, we are always going to pass the value in because we're going to change that value. Um, so what will end up happening is we'll say filters, filter name, the value, argument one, and then argument two. Filter sounds like it would good, like I said before, it would be good to filter a lot of data, but filters are rerun on every single update. So it's better to use computed properties for logic where you're filtering down a certain amount of things. The only thing that's filtering about filters is the name. <laughs> so don't so don't get confused there. All right, that's that's all about filters. That's it. That's all we've got. So you know, if you were just going to uh, create a localization site, for instance, and you needed to change currency across the site, you might need to do some calculations uh, to change that number, and then also, you know, make it euro or you know, prepend dollar sign or something like that. Filters would be really good for that. Featuring a clear presentation of well-defined topics, this course is for developers with an intermediate knowledge of JavaScript who want to learn how to build and maintain complex applications quickly and efficiently.